I know him, um, I don't know how many years, and actually we spent some time in Israel when we had some missiles going around. Anyway, um, thank you, Leo. thank you everybody. Uh, my name is Ron, and as I said, I work uh, today at Google. I'm running the developer relations at uh, Google Tel Aviv, and I've been developing uh, for, um, for many, many years. I think um, I started in um, Android 1.6. Uh, today's talk is about performance. Uh, see, you know, we can do a lot of stuff with our phones, right? We can throw um, birds or pigs. Uh, we blow bubbles. I hope you're not doing that right now. Um, we can navigate. We do a lot of stuff. And sometimes we actually, we forget that our cell phones are limited devices, almost embedded devices. Think about it. We have limited connectivity. We have limited memory space. Uh, we have um, CPU, it's expensive. We don't have endless number of uh, CPU cycles we can spin. And most important, um, juice to power all, all that. Battery. Battery is a big, big issue. Today I'm going to talk about uh, these four um, things memory, CPU, battery, networking, and try to help you uh, build better apps uh, that will perform better. Uh, and I would like to start with the uh, most critical one, in my opinion, battery. Now, at Google, I want to share with you um, uh, a recent research that we've done. We spent millions of dollars on this research. Uh, we learned that uh, when the phone dies, there is no battery. Uh, the user is less likely to uh, use any apps on it, including yours. Okay? One guy got it. All the rest of you, get out, you stay. Um, okay, so yeah, you should care about battery because when the phone, uh, battery runs, uh, uh, runs dead, the phone is dead, the user can't do anything without it and everybody loses. Um, and another thing is that when users see that uh, a specific app is draining the battery, they will uninstall it. Because every user would rather have some active phone, phone that can actually do something with that have your operate. So we're going to talk about battery. See, battery, it's a, it's a tricky part because it's a give and take. On one hand, we want to do stuff. On the other hand, the more stuff you do, the more battery you drink. So it's a give and take. Um, and there is a great um, research by a university that I hope to forget its name, uh, Purdue University. Uh, they th they uh, looked at um, the top uh, 100 apps Google Play, and they check what apps are actually doing that consumes energy, that drains the battery. What, for what things that they do, uh, they actually uh, use the battery. Where the energy goes, and they learned that only 25 to 30 percent of the energy goes to uh, core functionality of the app, like navigation or reading news, or getting the sports sport, or whatever. The rest, 70% of energy, goes on things that are not the core, uh, the core functionality of the apps, like uh, downloading ads to display, doing uh, massive location updates, um, periodic updates, and, and, and what. But these are not the reasons that you downloaded the app in the first place. So, um, the best tip that I can uh, give you in terms of battery, um, <laughs> yeah, okay, think why the user downloaded your app and focus on that job. This is why you are there in the first place. Okay? If you need to upload analytics, perfect, do that. But do that in a battery optimized way. If you want to do location updates, great. I think of the battery. In other words, sometimes it makes sense to defer work until it is the right time for battery. If it's not the core functionality of your app, if you don't have to do it right now, maybe you can defer the work until it is the right time for battery. And we'll see some examples about it uh, later. So let's talk a little bit about wake. See, um, our phone is active 
all the hardware components are working, screen is working, everything is cool, and then the user is using it and puts it in his pocket. Um, and Android understands that uh, the user is not using uh, the phone and we try to shut down the components in order to save battery. So first thing, we're going to dim uh, the screen and then we'll turn the screen off completely. And if the user is still not using um, the, uh, the phone, uh, the phone will actually go through into sleep mode where we actually turn off uh, additional uh, peripheral components. And in Marshmallow, we added another mode, those modes, which is like deep sleep, half of it, okay? Um, but still, sometimes, even if the user is not using the phone, and the phone and Android goes to sleep mode, apps do need to do some work. Maybe some background update, or maybe you want to do something, or maybe you're running into a very critical uh, piece of code, and you want to prevent the system from going to sleep, because you have this is critical code, and you have to uh, make sure that um, you will finish processing it. And that's why we have Wake Lock. Wake Lock API is pretty similar to a simple API. Anybody here use Wake Lock? No. Okay. Uh, so basically, uh, you use Power Manager, Wake Lock API, uh, you require Wake Lock, it tells the Android system, hey, wake up, I need to do something. Or it tells the Android, hey, I'm doing something very important, don't go to sleep. Um, and uh, uh, it's very easy to use. But the tricky part is not acquiring the lock. The, th the tricky part is releasing it. So let's say uh, you've acquired the lock because you want to do some fancy job like image processing or uploading something into your server. If everything goes, go goes well, you will do the job, finish it, and release the lock, and everything goes great. But what happens if suddenly that fancy uh, image processing algorithm, instead of taking, I don't know, 150 or 200 or one second, takes 10 minutes? What happens if uh, the server has, is having some uh, difficulties and suddenly you're waiting uh, forever for an answer that will never arrive? Or maybe there was an exception in your code. Maybe you caught it, maybe you didn't caught it. Maybe you caught that exception, but you never released it. There are a lot of paths in the code that could happen. And if you would require a lock and you never release it, basically it means that the phone will never go to sleep, and that's bad. And that's why when you want to uh, acquire uh, a wake lock, I would highly recommend not just calling the wake lock acquire, but calling the API that actually gets a timeout, actually, the parameter. And regardless whether you release it or not, once that timeout expires, your wake lock will be released automatically. Okay. Another uh, nice trick, um, think about it this way, the fair work. Uh, let's say my app wants to do some work 15 minutes from now. But there is another app that wants to do some work 20 minutes from now. What if we could tell that uh, to Android and tell it, hey, I want to do something 15 minutes from now, but if there is another app that wants to do some work around the same time, why don't you wake us both together? And we're going to do the job together, saving a lot of energy. And this is exactly what uh, inexact timers do. They basically tell us, hey, I want to do work in 5, 10, 20 minutes from now, but Android can <coughs> delay the work until it's, uh, it's the right time for battery. And that's good. So, Sum it up, release weight log, and batch weight logs. Now let's talk about networking, which is something which is very close to my heart. Looks familiar? <coughs> Who used this line? <laughs> All right. I'm glad everybody is. Um, so if anybody is using it and doing it, what's the big deal? I mean, accessing the network. Commodity, right? Everybody's doing it here in this room. Um, well, it turns out that our wireless phones are wireless. Okay, uh, they don't have uh, any wires connected to them, and in order to communicate with the base station, they use radio frequency. And it turns out that networking 
specifically over a region connection or cellular connection, has a significant impact on butter. <coughs> In fact, that's the number one butter killer today. If you will check what apps are doing that kills most of the butter, it will be networking. Not GPS, not script, not CPU, nothing. It will be accessing the network. And the main reason is that it's something that everybody is doing. Okay? GPS is a great butter loader, but most of the time it's off. Network, everybody's doing it all the time. Um, so in order to communicate with, uh, with the base station, with the cell tower, a radio um, and other device or cell phone communicates over radio frequency. But frequency is a limited resource. We just don't have enough of it. It's a physical thing. It's not a logical resource like IP addresses. We're running out of IPv4. Let's create IPv6 and boom, we have another huge address in this space. Frequency is physical um, resource, just like space in this room. We can't put, I don't know, another 2,000 people in this room. There's not enough space. Same goes with frequency. The base station doesn't have enough frequency uh, to talk with all of the clients all of the time. It simply doesn't have enough. Instead, what happens is the base station allocates frequency at given time slots to different subscribers, to different customers, to different clients, and talk with each one at a given moment. Now, a lot of um, uh, techniques have emerged in the past years trying to optimize just that the way we talk with a specific customer, with a specific cell phone at any given moment. Basically, trying to get more bits per hertz. Um, the latest are OFDM and OFDMA, that you probably know as LTE and, and 4G. Um, now, I, in order to, uh, to understand why networking is so uh, critical to battery life, we actually need to go and look uh, under the hood and see how things work. Uh, the state machine, the regular state machine is pretty complex. I created a simpler version here. So let's think or imagine that our uh, radio and our phone has three states. First one is idle. In idle mode, uh, we don't have any bandwidth. We can't transmit even one single bit. Okay? No frequency is allocated to us, but we're not using any power or very little power. Let's say the user opens an app and our app wants to send something to the internet. We need to get frequency. Uh, the base station moves us from idle to DCH. Now, DCH stands for um, dedicated channel. The dedicated channel, basically what happens is that the base station allocates frequency in a constant manner on a periodic interval to, the, to, to our cell phone. We get constant frequency like a clock all the time. In that mode, again, just to be thematics, we have high bandwidth, but we use a lot of power because we're transmitting to the wise power. So, uh, we got the frequency, we are in DCA mode, everything is cool, and we've done, we finished, uh, we don't need that much bandwidth. The base station will drop us to FECA mode. FECA mode stands for forward access channel. Basically, in this mode, the base station will still have this frequency to the but uh, not in a constant manner. Not just before we get, from time to time we get a frequency again. It's a simplified, very extremely simplified version of uh, what's going on. Let's say that we have half of the bandwidth and we're using half of the power. Once again, we're done. We don't need even that bandwidth. We go back to idle mode. Basically, all our phones here are now in idle mode. Now, those transitions are pretty expensive. First, they take time. So moving from idle to DCH, before you were able to transmit the very first bit, user will need to wait about two seconds. Again, depend on the network, depend on the base station, depend on the configuration, uh, depends on a lot of stuff, but it's around, around two seconds. Moving from DCH to FACH uh, has a tail time of 10 seconds. So it takes the network about 10 seconds to understand that, hey, we're allocating frequency to that guy over there, but he's not really using it. He doesn't need that much bandwidth, so we can move that frequency somewhere else and move that guy to FCA. Um, that's expensive. 
And we have another tail time from FSCH to, uh, to IDEL, which is 45 to 60 seconds. Again, it really depends on the network and depends on, on, on the configuration. Now, those tail times are extremely expensive, and they hurt us in so many ways. First, uh, they are a big problem to the AT&T, Verizon, and Orange, because basically, here is a frequency that we're allocating to a customer, to a cell phone that doesn't need it. We could use it somewhere else, and frequency is expensive, as I said. And second, in several networks, there is no such thing as quiet, meaning that if the base station has allocated frequency to my cell phone, and my cell phone has nothing to transmit, it will transmit random bits of ones and zeros. There is no such thing as frequency has been allocated and not being used. Okay, there are a lot of reasons why, why it's like that. But that's pure energy that we're wasting. So, another thing that we need to remember is that the data costs money to our users. Okay? Someone is paying for those bits. It can be the cell, the cell, uh, cell our service provider that charges the user eventually for it, or the user directly being billed based on this quota. But those bits cost money. So, the golden rule for networking is less radio time and less data. These are the two <coughs> principles that if you need to take something from today's talk, please let it be this. Um, it's easy to say, it's pretty harder to actually do that because when you think about it, we have tons of transactions in our apps. <coughs> And we've got uh, network transactions happening on background thread. I really hope you're running your network on a background thread. Um, and it's very hard for us to uh, say right now, hey, how many uh, threads are working, how many network requests are happening, what happens with them, and profile them. It's kind of hard. So I'm trying, again, to simplify it. And let's try to uh, categorize our network requests to uh, three main buckets. The first one is the user has asked us for some piece of information. He clicked on that article. <clears throat> he scrolls uh, the news list. He's doing something and we need to go and fetch data to present to the user. These are things that we need to do right now. Second batch is all those small data updates that we need to do uh, while the user is using our apps, like analytics, like location updates, like those small updates, maybe keep a lot of process. Um, messages. Those small updates that happens um, when the user is using our app, when the app is in foreground usually. And the last bucket is all those big data push that will usually happen in the background. Those could be like um, uploading a bunch of photos or syncing your email to Gmail or your contact list. Stuff that are not um, usually larger payloads and we don't really have to do that. Right now we usually do that in the background. Now, those last two buckets, we can optimize them by batching. And the first one, we can optimize by prefetching. And again, I'm going to explain about those two techniques. Let's start with batching. So, basically, batching, we take all those transactions that happens and we say, let's defer them to the right time. Let's batch them together, transfer them to something like that, minimizing radio transition states and saving lots of energy. <coughs> All the blue bars are here, that's wasted energy. The easiest way to do that, uh, we'll say, hey, I've got a transaction, a network request uh, to execute. Instead of executing it directly, I'm going to put it into a queue. It could be a very simple queue object or something more uh, fancy and complex like, um, I don't know, content provider, and you can even serialize everything to persistency just in case your app gets terminated. Now the question is, when do we purge the queue? What's the right time to say, hey, let's execute everything? So one approach will say, let's pick a number, let's say 10 messages in the queue, let's purge it. So that's good. But in fact, when you think about it, our phone is doing tons of stuff. And there is a good chance that before we're going to hit those 10 uh, messages and thresholds, 
some other route will actually access the network, which means that the radio will be in DCH or FCH mode. What if we could get some callback, a notification, telling us, hey, someone is already using the network. You've got a condition. You can run and do your transactions right now. Let's approach your queue. Wouldn't be, that be great? I think so, and this is why we introduced job scheduling in um, a year and a half ago in Android in Lollipop. So it's very easy to use and simple API. You give uh, some ID, the service component, the actual job you want to do, and uh, you give some criteria. Let's say I want uh, my network type to be admitted. So only Wi-Fi, which is admitter, or I can decide that any network will do. I can give some uh, deadline and timeouts, and even some extra criteria like uh, being charging, uh, connected to power, and stuff like that. So that's great, and it's awesome, and I really encourage you to use it. Um, the big question is, what happens if we're running a preload device? That's a new API that was introduced in Lollipop. So, in preload, we can do batching in several ways. First one is using sync adapters. Sync adapters are great for those big data updates that I talked about, the third bucket. Those data updates that are, um, uh, will happen in the background, big data uploads, photo sync, uh, GL sync, etc. But they're not that good for those small updates while the app is running. That's where GCM Network Manager comes from. GCM Network Manager is part of uh, Google Play services, meaning that it's run on every device since from Gingerbread and uh, up. Uh, again, very easy to use uh, an API. You just uh, uh, define a task. I want to run it uh, from five minutes from now to 15 minutes from now. And in my GCM task class, I only need to override one single um, method and return either result success or um, failed or um, retry. If I want to trigger, to force GCM Network Manager to trigger something, um, an event, I got an ADB shell command to do it. Now the second technique is prefetching. So if in, in uh, batching, uh, the trick was to defer work, defer network uh, request and batch them together, in prefetching, you're trying to do the opposite thing, uh, which is basically predicting the future. Think about it this way. The user opens your app, you fetch some data, this is the data. You wait it for 5, 10, 20 seconds, then scrolls, or maybe click on something, and then you go and fetch some more data, go and fetch some more data, and this is basically how your network request looks like. Okay, every time the user does something, you go and fetch the data for that user. In prefetching, we try to predict the future. We try to predict what data the user will need, what data the user will ask us uh, to fetch for him, and we try to fetch that now. Think about it. Not only we are improving battery life, we're also improving user experience because when the user will click on an article, will click on something, the information, the data will already be there, which is perfect. Um, how much to prefetch? So a part of prefetch we usually say on a 3G network will be, I don't know, 1 to 3 megabits, and on a 4G network, up to 5 megabits. <coughs> but we can look at it from another uh, perspective. Uh, it makes no sense fetching data that the user wouldn't want to see. So let's, th let's uh, think of it uh, as the optimum will be fetching the data that the user will need in this session. And a typical session is one to two minutes of usage. If you want to check, you can use analytics and see uh, the exact average session uh, for your app. It really depends on app category. So, uh, we can fetch the information that we think the user will, uh, will want to see and you can see that uh, if you do a good job, you can hit like 70% 70, 70 cache in. Uh, that's perfect. But we can do even better. Uh, we can optimize based on the user and the device. Um, do we fetch, uh, prefetch more over Wi-Fi? Yes, Wi-Fi is very cheap when it comes to battery. Um, do we fetch more while charging? Hell yes. As far as I care, download the internet if you're charging. Um, um, what else? Uh, while the user is walking, we can detect that the user is walking. We have an API for that. When the user is walking, he's got a shorter attention span, so 
the, uh, the average session length will be shorter, about 20, 30 seconds. Um, fetch more when the user is driving, depends what your app is doing. If your app is all about, I don't know, roadblocks and car traffic and stuff like that, yeah, the user is driving, fetch more. If you're using sports, the user is driving, fetch less. Um, fetch more and fast networks, yes. We don't care about bits, we care about radio time. So in 2G network, uh, the time it will take us to download 903 images, the same time on 4G network, we'll be able to download like 12, uh, 12 images. So fetch more over fast network. Another uh, important thing about networking, not only radio time, but also this thing, payload size. Here are two images. Okay? Which one is better quality? Who think it's the left one? Who think it's the right one? Who think they're the same and I'm fooling you? <laughs> there are some people actually. Okay. In fact, uh, the right one, so just to give you, uh, you, you had no clue. Okay, you couldn't tell the difference between them. And they're being projected with, uh, I think, the best video uh, projected in the reads huge screen, huge great screens, and you couldn't tell the difference between an image that cost that, that weights 160k to an image that cost that weights about third, 45k. Third, less money for the user, less time to wait for the data, less time in, with radio. It's a win-win-win, no matter how you look, uh, the way you look at it. Um, and it's just playing with the genuine quality. Um, <coughs> And if it's good for the big guys, this is what they are using. This is gender quality at Google Images, Google, Facebook, Yahoo, all those guys. If it's good for them, it's probably good for you. Now let's talk about, it's a favorite topic, JSON. Who is using JSON? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Raise, 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 raise. Keep, keep it up, keep it up. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, um, JSON, we love JSON. And the reason we love JSON is because it's human readable. It's easy for us as engineers, as programmers, to use it. But when you think about it, protocol needs to be optimized for machines. Machines need to, to read it, not humans. Here's a typical JSON. We've got tons of, excuse my French, bullshit here. Okay, um, spaces, dashes, brackets. Uh, who needs those? And furthermore, um, when we parse it, we actually need to copy the value <coughs> properly, figure out, is it a string, an integer, double, what is it? Okay? That means we're allocating memory and then dropping it. It's a, and it has a, a big influence on, on memory as well. Okay? So it's very, very inefficient. The solution? Flat buffers. And I would like to introduce you to flat buffers. Flat buffers is basically a library that uh, we developed it at Google and we open sourced it. Uh, the way it works, you have a schema, you define your uh, data scheme, run it in the compiler, and you get uh, the result are Java files, CPP files, and with Go files you can use in your code. Now, um, the biggest advantages of flat buffers are basically that um, not only uh, payload size, but also number of CPU cycles you need to run in order to parse it and to decode or encode and um, the fact that everything is done in place, in memory. Okay, you don't need to do uh, memory allocations. Um, here's a comparison of uh, coding and encoding the same data using flat, flat buffer protocol, JSON and XML. And you can see flat buffers are in blue. You can see flat buffers? They're in blue. <laughs> Okay, and if that didn't convince you, hey, I think there is a problem, but to be uh, Facebook, uh, about four months ago, uh, they changed to flat buffers and they wrote an awesome blog post on, on how flat buffer improved their, um, their performance. Uh, I really, really, you know, I really recommend you to go and read it. They've done an amazing job writing this blog post. I'll give you the TLDR, uh, parse time, used from 35 milliseconds to 4. 
35 milliseconds to 4. That's huge. That means that instead of losing two frames every time you parse something, you can parse while the user is scrolling, plus uh, some lot of um, enhancements in memory usage. So, uh, performance tip number four, uh, smaller data wins the internet. Guys, less data, less data. Okay, memory performance. I know I wanted to say something about it, but I really forgot. So uh, there's a here's a typical uh, heap size in our uh, application. So we allocate an object, we get memory allocated. And uh, every time we hit a threshold, a GC will occur uh, to release some uh, memory for us. Uh, now the thing is that when garbage collection runs, everything else stops, including your app. Which means that if we need to update the screen while the GC happens, we're using a frame and the user see those hiccups, those jumps, those little mm, something is not right there. And this is why we really want to uh, care about GC and minimize those. GCs are great for memory management uh, languages, but we just need to be careful we don't uh, stack them together inside a single frame or such, because then we will suffer from performance. <laughs> so, garbage collection, it's it, and it's permanent. Um, Let's talk about the biggest issues with garbage collection. I'm going to speed up because we're running out of time. Um, bitmaps. So bitmaps are big issues because if this is how our, our heap is, looks like, and then the heap gets fragmented. Uh, we just got another small allocation there, and we do need right now uh, to allocate some memory for bitmaps. Bitmaps are pretty big, and there is no memory. There is no place to put that. So we need to run GC in order to get things uh, correctly and, and defrag and stuff and allocate the bit. Now there are several things that you can uh, do to improve uh, the way you work with bitmaps. The first thing is smaller pixel formats. We don't really need 888, we can use 565. Again, you can't tell the difference between these two images, but the data, uh, the bits per pixel in 565 are half, less bits. It's just small. Uh, second thing we can do is uh, bitmap reuse. If we're using a lot of bitmaps and they're just pretty much the same size, we don't need to allocate new memory for them. We can reuse the memory from one bitmap to another. And there's a, an, an option, a flag in bitmap option to do that. Another option, another technique is to scale down images. We download a big image from the internet, you don't need that big image in memory. We can downscale it, and there are some techniques to, uh, to downscale an, an image, uh, sample size, and then interpolation. It's, it's, a, it's a whole new. Lucky for you, you don't really need to do all this. Uh, there are some great, great, great um, open source libraries that will do most of, the, most of the heavy lifting, and I really recommend to use whatever you want, but make sure your, uh, the library that you're using actually uh, doing those stuff. Big, bit of, bit of big, right? Make them, make them small. Hash maps. Anybody using hash maps here? Okay. All those of you who didn't raise your hands, you're lying. Get out. <laughs> um, so the way hash map works, uh, we get a key, we hash it, and then we get an index. That index is a location in a bigger array, and this is where we put the value, we store the value. Um, and the thing is that the, uh, the thing we need to avoid is, obviously, collisions. What happens if two keys hash into the same uh, place? What happens if you want to store 1,000 objects, uh, 1,000 values in an array of length of 20? You'll get a lot of collisions. Okay, and then some daisy chains happening and other things. In order to avoid that, uh, hash maps actually start with allocating a pretty big array, and that array, most of it, is not allocated. It's, it's allocated, sorry, but not being used. Um, and that is, works okay on laptops, on PC, servers, but when you think about a memory of the device like a phone, um, it really hurts us. And that's why in Android runtime, we introduced um, array maps. 
So array maps are basically, uh, they offer the same functionality, the same API like hash maps, but they work differently uh, behind the scene. Instead of using one big array, we use two small arrays, and we have uh, reduced memory footprint dramatically. So the way array map works is that we have one small array where we store the, uh, the hash keys in a sorted way. And each key uh, points to uh, another array, the location in another array, where we store the key and the value, the key and the value, in an in interval uh, way. Okay? Again, the same order as they are stored here. So when we uh, want to uh, hash something, Okay, we have the key, we hash it, and then we do a binary search on the first array to find the index. And once we find it, we can look uh, directly in the uh, second array uh, based on location. We have, we have the index immediately. Basically, what happens here is um, that we trade off memory for CPU. So operations like storing, uh, storing data and fetching data um, uh, uh, <coughs> cost us a little bit more, but uh, we, uh, we really improve memory. So if we don't allocate, if we use an, an array map, but we didn't store anything, we're not allocating every single byte compared to hash map. So there is a trade-off, trade-off between CPU and memory. And the big question is when to use which. Um, so if you have, uh, you need uh, to store a map with dozens of objects with values, or hundreds of values, up to a thousand, our maps are good for you. Because the overhead and CPU time, neglect it, you can forget about it. Another thing that we uh, often do is storing maps of maps, where each map has very small uh, footprint. Um, again, array maps really, really, really make sense here. So use array maps, Right Auto boxing. Okay, that's another memory problem. See, in Java we've got primitive types like int, boolean, float. They are the representative of uh, the IGP standard. But we also have objects: boolean with the big B, integer with the capital I, and float, which are objects. They're not the same thing. Let's take a look at this simple life of code, uh, code of line. Um, value equals zero. So that's a primitive integer. But that's an object. <coughs> what happens behind the, behind the scene is an uh, autoboxing. Basically what Java will do, it will convert that primitive type into a, an integer object and then will assign its value. Um, auto boxing is cool. It's awesome. It helps us, you know, it saves us a lot of work. It helps us do stuff like that. Uh, but again, there are some pitfalls. Let's take a look at those two forwards. Uh, here we're using an integer, primitive type, and here we're using an integer, an object. Okay? Actually, uh, what happens here is that we create new integer, we push it value, and we add it to top. And the big thing here is create an integer. We allocate a lot of objects during this slope. These are objects that are being allocated in your heap space. Garbage collector will need to bring those. <coughs> now, I know uh, that uh, most of you don't write these kind of for loops, but it becomes a real problem when you look at hash maps. Because usually what we do, we do uh, hash maps. And here we're going to get an integer, which is an object, not a primitive int. And we store an object. And what will happen is that every time we put or update or get stuff, we're going to get some other boxes. happens there. Because we need to convert from primitive to object and vice versa. And this is exactly why we came up with all those sparse array. Okay? They work exactly the same, but instead of uh, having an object as the key, we have primitive, primitive types um, as the key, and we avoid those auto boxes. Now, how would you know that you have the, the auto boxing issue and the, and the 
that you suffer from it. Uh, one good way is to look at uh, the allocation chart. If you see a lot of allocations, okay, a lot of generics being allocated in one single um, call stack, it means that probably you're storing a lot of stuff in, in a hash out there and you're allocating integers temporarily. Another uh, good point uh, to look is uh, in tracing. Look for uh, calls for integer uh, value of. This is what happens uh, during autopsy. Okay? You see a lot of those, there's a lot of objects that are being allocated um, temporarily just to do this conversion from generic to, um, to primitive and vice versa, and then the garbage collection will need to, uh, to clear those. So avoid autopsy. I think we have five minutes for QA. Awesome. <laughs> Actually, takes less memory than the, yeah. the other yeah. one. Yeah, it's a 16 bits per, per pixel instead of 32. I think it's less. Okay. Repeat sound. <laughs> <laughs> So for Google Analytics, our recommendation now is uh, to have a timeout for batching of 30 minutes. So upload your analytics once every 30 minutes. Uh, so that's 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 you know, just change in uh, analytics XML file. Just change uh, that attribute. Another thing that you can do, uh, if you uh, know in your application that you're touching the network, Redview is already active. You can tell it is hey, picky back, okay, and upload whatever you have right now. I'm going to take two more and uh, yeah. Talking about the white spaces and this, uh, I mean, uh, it should be tools, uh, the stuff, uh, the network stuff that is supposed to be on our platform. Yeah, but we, you have uh, uh, white spaces, brackets, um, columns, um, a lot of stuff that are, you know, they're there just for you to make that file uh, easy for you to read. That's By great. Now, that, that's cool, but it costs it costs you somewhere else. You know, if you look at every uh, binary protocol, it's always more efficient for machines than string based Both in size and in parsing. Yeah. So I have a question about the uh, what you talk about the, the GCs and that we, have, we need to avoid GCs. Uh, I have a question. With uh, immutability, because uh, I use a lot of rigid programming in my application, and immutability is the rule in it. And how, how can we avoid uh, too much code in GCs and keep the immutability? So, yeah, immutability is, is an issue where I see, your, I see the way uh, people are looking at me about the time. Um, so, we're going to talk a little bit uh, afterwards about it, but generally, in, in what I said about GC is great for again uh, for um, memory management system. We don't, you know, we couldn't tell you anything to GC and take care of uh, freeing your uh, your objects by yourself. And then this whole talk will be about memory. Um, so I'm not saying that we should avoid GC at all costs. What I'm saying is that we should be careful about how we allocate memory, especially for specifically for bitmaps. Those small objects that makes a temporary object that makes our heap very fragmented, and then we're going to cause GCs to be uh, cascaded in the same 60 milliseconds per frame, and then we build up our frame. Okay, if you have GC from one, you know, every once in a while, don't worry about it. Okay, 
it's not the same game, yeah, but it's just a lot more. All right, I think we need to wrap up. Oh, maybe one or two. One more, yeah, if we have time, yeah, sure. Uh, is there a difference uh, in size between a serialized protobuf and a serialized uh, flat buffer? Between flat buffer and protobuf buffer? Yeah. Wow, I don't really remember on the top of my head. Uh, I know that uh, flat buffers are improving <coughs> protobuf buffers. Uh, in terms of payload size, I don't think it's a significant difference. Um, the big difference is in uh, the fact that uh, you do all the uh, decoding in place. So you don't have you have basically zero more bytes, and the fact that you don't need to uh, well the product buffers you also don't need, you don't need to allocate any compare, but um, that's that, those are big big differences. All right, thank you very much. I'm going to be here uh, throughout the day. Tomorrow I'm flying back home. Uh, so to catch you.